I had, and I still have, a tremendous amount of persistence. Once I get on a puzzle, I can't get off. I mean, if she had told me, never mind, it's too much work, I'd have blown my top because I want to beat this damn thing as long as I've gone as far as I can. I can't just leave it after I found out so much about it, you know what I mean? I can't, I have to keep going to find out how it ultimately, mm -hmm. what it's the matter with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So and that drive is just in you, that particular no, drive. That's a puzzle drive. I, yeah. that, you see, that's what accounts for my wanting to cipher hieroglyphics, but trying to open safes. Once I said, I like the puzzle. Of yeah. Unknown what it is. To, but nobody to taught you that. That you just no, I don't think so. Yeah. No. I taught you that it's a good thing to see no. a problem through. To I don't a think so. No, no, no. It's much more instinctive. I couldn't help it. I mean, once I got into a puzzle, I like to do puzzles. If people gave me a puzzle, I would have to work it out. I don't mean a word puzzle or something like that. Those, I didn't like them. But any of these sort of arithmetic or geometric or. You know, I put 28 trees in six lines of eight trees each or something like that. You know, I don't know, like, come on, that's complicated enough. But that kind of stuff, I work a long time trying to figure it out. And so I got a good reputation because when I hear a puzzle for the first time, it would take me a normal amount of time to work it out. But when I was in high school, because I'd worked on puzzles and I began to get a reputation for knowing how to do it, there were many little puzzles that people had, you know, little special things. And after a while, you hear the same puzzle again and again. But now you know the answer. Or for instance, in the beginning of the day, in the first period, a guy would come with a problem in geometry or something in his advanced class, and I'd look at it and I'd get puzzled. It'd take me 15 or 20 minutes. During the day, another guy would come. I'd say, draw a line from here to here, and then you can show it by this and that. So for one guy that knew it took me 20 minutes, there were five guys thought I was a super genius. I did it in the flash. Mm -hmm. So I had a fancy reputation. Therefore, every puzzle came to me that it was known to man. Every damn crazy conundrum that people had invented. I knew. Find it. <laughs> so when I got to MIT, I was a freshman. And I remember the first dance or something. One of the seniors had his girlfriend. And the senior was telling the girlfriend that this guy's a very smart guy. So this girl apparently knew a lot of puzzles. And she comes up to me during this dance, she says to me, they say you're a smart guy, here's one for you. And she start out like, uh, I don't know, a man has, eight, I can't remember the puzzles anymore, but a man has eight bales of wood to chop. And I said, so he starts by chopping every other one in three parts. Because I'd heard that. Oh, you heard that. And it kept going like this. And then she'd go away and she'd come back with another one and I'd always know. Finally, she came. This was a great triumph. She came to me and she said, a mother and daughter were traveling in Europe. I said, the daughter got the bubonic plague. Because, you see, she used up everything else. And I knew one damn thing that started that way. The mother and daughter are traveling. I took a flying guess. The mother and daughter are traveling in Europe. It's a long story about how they stop at a hotel. And then the mother the next day goes to the daughter's room and there's somebody else there. Or it's all cleaned up or something. And there's somebody else there. And she says, where's my daughter? What daughter? You came alone. But we registered. I registered. Then registers only got her name. Mm -hmm. There's no register in that, that room. And so on and so on and so on and so on. There's a big mystery. What happened? Well, the answer is that the daughter got the bubonic plague. And the hotel, not wanting to have to close up, you see, spirits the daughter away and cleans up the room and erases all the stuff. And then there was the explanation. It was a tremendous long tale. But I heard it dumb story, you see. And so it's the last minute when she says the mother and daughter were traveling in Europe, and I said, the mother got the bubonic plague, she collapsed. Because that was hardly enough clue to, <laughs> to work that one. Because <laughs> by that time, I heard every puzzle that anybody had ever cooked up, you see. <laughs> so I was good at working puzzles. It also kept me going, because people would bring me all this stuff, and it was fun to exercise your mind and mm -hmm. all these things. We had a thing at school called an algebra team. And that was pretty a lot of fun. We would travel to other schools. The algebra team would have a competition with another algebra team from another school. So we'd travel to different schools, the team. Uh, the team consisted of five guys. Mm -hmm. I might have been girls, I don't remember. Okay, yeah. In those days we didn't worry. Guys yeah. and people it didn't make any people understood. Right. Five people on a team. Right. And what you'd do is you'd sit in a row of seats and another team would sit in another row. Mm -hmm. Now, some guy, or people, or whoever it was that <laughs> organized it, had invented problems in algebra. And the idea was that a teacher of one or the other of the two schools who was running the contest would take an envelope, okay, 
And on the envelope on the outside is 45 seconds. We should say this one is 45 seconds. Opens it up and writes the problem on the blackboard. And then when she's finished writing, she says, go, okay? Then the 45 seconds start. You see, you have more than 45 seconds because she's writing and you can think. Now, the game was that you have a piece of paper. You can write anything. You can do anything. You can do it any way you want. You can stay any way. It doesn't make any difference what you do. The only thing that counted was the answer. If the answer was six books, that was the answer. And you write, the paper would get full of crap, calculations, but you have to write the answer six books and put a big circle around it. The thing that was in the circle, that's what the answer was. And if that was in the circle was the right answer, you would. And if it wasn't, it wasn't. It didn't make any difference how it got that way. Okay? And the question was speed. Because the people who had made up the timings on these things had made them all a trifle short. It was impossible, almost impossible, to do the problem by any conventional way, a straightforward way. If you, you know, any one of these problems, you put A is the number of red books and B is the number of blue books, and you do it, grind, 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 and you'll get six books. But if you did it that way, it'll take you 50 seconds. <laughs> it was terrible. So you had to think, is there any, is there a way to see it? And sometimes you could see it in a flash, and sometimes you have to invent another way to do, you know, because you knew the regular way you could just about make it if you were tremendously fast. So you'd get fast as you could in algebra and thinking as quickly as possible and trying to see another way to do it always, you see. And it was wonderful exercise and practice. And I got pretty damn good at that. I got better and better at that, and I got to be the head of my own team, you know number one man on the team, mm -hmm. and uh, it was an awful lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And this is the reason why I learned to do algebra very quickly. And it came in very handy in college and so on, when we had problems in calculus and so on. It didn't take me any time at all to do the algebra part, you know. I got very quick to see where it's going and to do the algebra. And it was a great advantage, so I think that was very good, those little things. At this things point, had you invented your own symbols to do the work, or that, that something different? Oh, I invented some symbols, but I didn't do it for this. Uh -huh. no, that was another thing. That was before, when the first year in school. In college or in No, in high school. school. Early one or two Nine, years in high school. Yeah. Thirteen, when I was thirteen. Mm -hmm. I had uh, gotten learned some mathematics and trigonometry and worked it out. I forgot what trigonometry was, except that it had something to do with connections between sines and cosines and so on. And I discovered one connection, and then I worked out all the rest of trigonometry. I knew what I was trying to do, and I proved all the theorems, but not by the methods of the regular yeah, book. Well, you didn't have a book or what? No. I read a book on trigonometry, perhaps when I was 11 or 12, and I had forgotten what was in it, except that there were connections, there was some relationship uh -huh. between a sine, a cosine, and a tangent, and this and that. There were relationships. Mm -hmm. And there were formulas for half angle, cosines, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And there was something for triangles, you could connect the sides somehow. Mm -hmm. That was a generalization of Pythagoras' rule for when the angle was at 90. That's all I knew. Mm -hmm. Save one thing that I didn't know. I knew that the area of a triangle was the product of the two sides times the sine of the angle in between the two sides times a half or something like that. I don't know whether I knew that or I proved that, but I used it all the time. Hmm. Well, what happened was that I invented a set of problems which were right triangle problems, but instead of giving one or the other of the two sides to find the third, you were given the difference of two sides to find them. For instance, the typical problem was you have a flagpole and there's a string that comes down from the top, okay? And there's some kind of thing like this that when you pull the string out tight, you're five feet from the base of the pole. And uh, when you pull the string straight down, the string is three feet longer than the pole. It sticks out. And when you pull it out straight, it's five feet out. How high is the pole? Right. That was my problem. Yeah. I realize now, in all cases when I was young, in everything I did, there was always a practical problem. I don't mean I was trying to solve a practical problem. I mean, if I were doing any mathematical thing at all, I would find a practical example for which this would I be see. useful. If it weren't useful, I didn't seem to think it was very interesting. Hmm. So I had to find a practical example yes. where you need my theorem. So I had some equation for solving that, and I was working with those problems. And I noticed, as a result of it, some connection, perhaps the connection of sine squared plus cosine squared equal one or something, mm -hmm. had to be true. And that reminded me of the trigonometry. And so I began to work out interconnections between things more. I knew that you could get all the sine and cosine, and the tangent was the ratio, and then the secant was the reciprocal, and so I began to get every one in terms of the sine. Because the book was long gone. No, the book was long gone. So I worked out all the formulas by which I could get every form from the sine. And then I found a formula for the sine of half an angle. 
I did that by taking an isosceles triangle and knowing my formula for the area being the product of the lengths times the sine of the angle in between. I also could find the area by the base times the height. But the base is the side times the sine of half the angle and the, si and the height is the si cosine of half. So it turned out twice the sine of half times the cosine of half is equal to the sine of the full angle. So I had a formula for the sine of twice an angle. Okay, it's two sine theta cosine theta. And then always with the practical bent, I realized that with that formula, and then I found an addition formula for sine. I could, with starting with the sine of five degrees as given, I could work out the sine and cosine and tangent of every other angle. But I worked out by drawing triangles and so on, mm -hmm. various formulae. Each one I proved by myself, you know, to get the formula. Until I worked out all the trigonometry, including the formulas for triangles and everything else. I had the notebook many years later, and I looked up when I, you know, when you're studying in school. My demonstrations were often different than the demonstrations. Sometimes, for a simple thing where I didn't notice a simple way to do it, I went all over the place till I got it. Hmm. The other time, it was most clever. The standard demonstration of the book is so much more complicated than this very clever little thing. <laughs> so it's interesting. Sometimes I had a beat the regular class book, and sometimes it was the other way around. Hmm. So it was kind of this way, that way. Yeah. I don't know if I have that notebook anymore. It's possible. Yeah, exactly. I, might still I, I remember right. It got too long to write out S I N every time for. Science. Oh, that's the, That's where you started. Yeah. Well, when I was doing all this, I didn't like the symbol S I N for sign. Like they wrote log L O G, and they didn't like all those extra letters in the middle. It looked to me like like function of x, f of x. They're mixed up. It's like f times x or s times i times n times theta. I didn't like it, so I invented symbol like a square root sign. I made a kind of a sigma with a long arm sticking out of the sigma, and I put the theta underneath it. And then for the tangent, it was the same idea as a tau, but the top of the tau is extended, and then I put the theta on it. It was tangent. And then the cosine, I made a kind of gamma and extended it, but it looked a little bit like a square root, but I think I put a curl in it or something. I made a rounded hole there. Now, the inverse sign was the same sigma, but left to right reflected, so that it was started with a horizontal line, then the sigma, and you put the theta. That was the inverse sign. Not sine to the minus one. That was crazy. That, they used to have that in books. That would mean the reciprocal of the sign, one over the sign. If I wanted sine to the minus one, that meant one over the sign, not inverse sign. You see, and my symbols were better. I also didn't like the dy, dx, because you know you have a tendency to cancel the d's. So I made a different kind of a sign, a kind of an and sign little and symbol, a different symbol instead of a D. And logarithms was an L, big L, with the thing you take the logarithm inside. And I got used to using them, and I thought it was just as good as any other symbol, which is true. It doesn't make use what symbol use, but I discovered later what makes a difference. Because when I was explaining something to a kid in the school, I started to make these symbols. <laughs> and he says, what the hell are those? And then suddenly I realized that if I'm going to talk to anybody else, I can't do it. So I gradually gave up my symbols, and I used the standard symbol. I also invented at the time a set of symbols for the typewriter, like Fortran has to do. Oh, so that when I type stuff, I could type equations. You know, asterisk for multiple and or something. Like yeah, that. yeah, because typewriters didn't have so many characters on the menu. No, I just used my own the typewriter. I own. Mm -hmm. That was another thing I used to do: repair typewriter, fix them all the time with rubber bands and <laughs> paper clips. Instead of a spring, if it were missing, I had a rubber band. The rubber bands didn't break down like they do here in California. It's last much longer yeah, yeah. before they break down. After all, what I was doing, I was fixing something for a friend of mine, or for myself, or for my cousin. And uh, it wasn't a big deal. I wasn't professional repair, man. I just fixed it so it would work. But the whole problem of discovering what was the matter and figuring out what you'd have to do to fix it, that was all the same whether I fixed it with a rubber band or the right spring. I didn't have the right spring. Mm -hmm. So later on in Los Alamos, I was fixing the Marshan computers all the time. 